Um, thank you everyone for joining the St. Anne's um, first Meeting Minds Global Talk um, with uh, Dr. Laura Smith. Uh, Laura is a St. Anne's doctoral student and is a presidential historian whose research analyzes the development of presidential power in foreign policy at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, in Laura's research, she is seeking to challenge the conception of only associating the expansive executive power with the modern presidency. Uh, Laura's research is supported by the Philip Davies Fellowship at the British Library, and we're very delighted to have you with us, Laura. Thank you so much, Jason, and it's an absolute privilege and honor uh, to be here tonight, and uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, so. I'm really excited uh, to talk a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk, as you saw from the title, um, about something very timely, about understanding presidential history after the Trump administration, sort of help try and disentangle some of these questions that all presidential historians are really struggling with at the moment following this unprecedented nature of the Trump administration. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I am unusual eccentric figure adjective. I am at St. Anne's in my second year of my second doctorate. I did my first doctorate at the University of Mississippi, which some of you may know is the other Oxford, it's Oxford, Mississippi, um, the bluest part of Mississippi, which is saying something. And um, it was a, a cultural experience, I will say, because when I was finishing up my first doctorate, Donald Trump was uh, in office. And it made teaching and um, those sorts of activities very interesting and challenging in some respects. Um, before then, I'm half British, I'm half Canadian. So I did my degrees in the UK. I did my master's at UCL. I did an American studies degree a year abroad in Maine. So I spent a quarter of my life in the States, living in all M states, randomly enough, Maine, Massachusetts, and Mississippi. So I got a good feel for both, you know, traditionally liberal, if you say, or democratic strongholds in uh, Maine and Massachusetts, and then definitely the Deep South, uh, obviously a Republican stronghold in Mississippi. So it was a really interesting experience. Some of you may probably be aware that doing a doctorate in America, it, what normally happens is you get a scholarship because it's very, very expensive, obviously, tremendously expensive. I've never been able to afford to go. Um, and you get a scholarship, uh, if you're lucky, that will enable you to get some teaching experience while you're pursuing your studies. Um, and that was incredibly helpful for me, incorporating those two things. Uh, I'd like to go to academia, so it was really helpful. Um, being in the real Oxford, if you like, University of Oxford, uh, as much as I love it, obviously we live in very uh, unstable and unpredictable economic times. And so it's been quite challenging sort of looking from term to term, seeing what teaching, what jobs I can, I can get that are gonna sort of give me that stability so I don't have to be worried about where the next income, where the next check is going to come from. Um, so that, that, is, that is definitely a challenge. And during the pandemic, I was lucky to pick up a lot of online teaching, which uh, to the amount I would never have been able to do if I had to do in person. But doing it online was helpful, getting that experience. I was nominated. Um, I was very privileged to be nominated by my students for a teaching award. And I've since also been an adjunct assistant professor at Richmond in the, the American University in London. So. I go down to London once a week from Oxford. Uh, this week we had two hours uh, with my students, a lecture seminar on Barack Obama. Um, and it's the end of the semester, so they're all hanging in there. I had to really bring the enthusiasm, but I, I hopefully I'll bring the enthusiasm tonight as well. So my picture may disappear. Uh, hopefully you'll still see my voice. I'm gonna share my slides now. Uh, don't worry, they're not too many. Uh, and I want to make sure that I spend, I have enough time at the end to answer as many of your questions as I can. So without further ado, let me just grab my slides here. Here we go. Okay, so just to talk a little bit about my research, um, I started my, my, sec my first doctorate was on Andrew Jackson. I was gonna <laughs> say the election of 1832. And uh, if I didn't tell you who that was, that'd be really mean. Um, so it's Andrew Jackson, which is why I've included that picture on the left there of Donald Trump, who obviously infamously chose to, that portrait of Andrew Jackson uh, as you know, he's always liked to be called General Jackson uh, to hang in his Oval Office. And it's really controversial, not I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about that uh, research tonight, but it is really controversial when comparisons are made between Jackson and Donald Trump. And yet I really felt that it was really important to talk about those connections uh, because we do see the sort of dangers of the use of presidential power um, and the lack of sort of checks and balances when there are those uh, precedents that are set uh, by Jackson, for example. So 
I feel very strongly, uh, having written Washed to Post Office and, and various things like that, that this is something that when you have, for example, historians who have spent many, many years as biographers of people like Jackson, sometimes they adopt sympathies, sometimes subconsciously, um, sympathies toward these characters without being an analytical enough, in my opinion. And so my connections, the things that I saw between Jackson and Trump, including talking about populism, which is a really thorny issue for US historians or historians in general. Um, there really isn't a collective agreement on defining populism. The connections that I made received a lot of vociferous response, as you can imagine. But it is something that I, I feel deserves more explanation and more discussion and should see more of the light of day, really. But what I do now is I've continued to focus on presidential power, but I moved in time and place to talk about the man on the right, which is William Howard Taft. He was the president that many people have forgotten and not heard of, so don't feel badly, uh, in between Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. He was president from 1909 to 1913. And I talk about his foreign policy toward the Western Hemisphere specifically, because that really is remained unexplored. And so here he is, governor of the Philippines in this picture. Um, obviously he was known for being a very uh, <laughs> round man. I think we could all see that. Um, and that's really what he's famous for. If you've ever heard of Taft, you probably know of the sort of anecdote of him getting stuck in the bathtub. Um, but I'm, I, I don't analyze uh, his bath habits. I, I analyze his foreign policy. So I've moved, I, I like to see that I'm focusing on researching domestic, researching then foreign policy and presidential power in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, so I like to encompass uh, all of these periods and look at connections to the development of presidential power. But that's enough about me. Let's talk about presidential history and where we are today. So some of these things that I really, really wanted to get across with these points is I included this slide on the party system because I became very aware, and I'm sure some of you came across this as well, on social media, um, on, on even cable news, that sometimes, especially near the beginning of the Trump administration, you would have commentators who would come on and who would make these outlandish comments. Uh, in particular, for example, I'm thinking of Jeffrey Lord, who was banned from CNN after um, making a neo-Nazi comment on Twitter. He would repeatedly, in his commentating on CNN, claim that the Democratic Party of, for example, the Jim Crow 1890s, 1900s, 1920s, was the same as the Democratic Party of today, which obviously is completely untrue. So I wanted to just emphasize that point by breaking down very briefly the party systems. Obviously, the time frames are debatable. Um, but there is broad agreement on these time points of how we define the six party systems that we recognize and what the parties were called. So we started with federal, Federalist versus Democrat Republicans. Democrat Republicans, very confusing. That is just one party, uh, not two. Uh, we get the Whigs versus the Democrats. Third party system, Republicans, that's Lincoln Republicans versus Democrats. And then we get the fourth, the fifth party system. And we see that shift there with the fifth party system, that's FDR bringing in that shift. When we get to the sixth party system, the question that a lot of, and this really comes from political science more than anything else, the question that we really have now is where are we now? How do we understand the context that we're in considering that there's been such a rise of hyperpartisanship since the 1990s? Are we in a new party system? Are we in the seventh party system now? How can we identify this and how do we define it? So these are just one of the really key issues that political historians are dealing with today. I also wanna talk about this modern presidency. Uh, some of you who uh, may be uh, familiar traveling in the US will be familiar with these pictures. These are pictures that are often sold as, um, I don't know, sort of mementos of, of the presidency. And I just find them really interesting in terms of the characters they include. Obviously on the top, you have a depiction of the Democrats. You have Barack Obama sitting next to JFK, uh, considering you know they're both young men when they came to the presidency. I once wrote about comparing their elections, 1960 to 2008, which was really interesting. So that's an interesting one. You've got FDR there, you've got Bill Clinton, Woodrow Wilson, Harry Truman, LBJ. You've got Jimmy Carter and you've got Andrew Jackson in the background. Obviously it just depicts 
how much the party has changed uh, over the century plus. And then in the Republican column in the bottom there, you've got both Bushes, Reagan, Ford, Lincoln. Uh, you've got obviously Trump there, Eisenhower, uh, TR. You've got even Nixon there, which is interesting. You've got Coolidge in the background, which, uh, I mean, there are connections between Coolidge and Reagan, how, the, how they sort of viewed power, which, and, you know, Reagan really idolized Coolidge. Um, so there are these really interesting connections in terms of analyzing the presidency. So this is sort of spanning beyond what is usually defined as modern. A modern presidency is normally defined as FDR forward in terms of the scope of the executive office, how much power it has, its administrative bureaucracy. And any of you who are fans of presidential libraries know that the first presidential library is Hoover's. There are 13 in existence right now. In fact, you could buy a presidential passport, so-called, and you could go around and collect stamps like the National Park stamp. You could tell I'm an enthusiast. Um, and at the end, if you, if you show your passport and say, look, I've been to all 13 libraries, they'll give you a highly coveted National Archives paperweight. I have one to go. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. But it just shows you how the presidency has grown in size and the definitions of modern are very, very controversial. You could have people, for example, reflecting my research, who say that McKinley in 1900, you know, he was assassinated in 1900 was the first modern president because he dealt with the Spanish-American War in a way that used modern technology. He used all of this to be able to find out what was going on on the battlefield. He dealt with the press differently. He expanded the office in terms of bureaucracy slightly. You know, all of these different elements that people use to define what is the modern presidency, there's no consensus on it really. Um, and it's a question as to whether you look at it in terms of things that are maybe superficial, like, you know, how many telephone lines were in the White House versus something that may be more substantive, like policy, for example. I'm not going to spend too long on this slide. I just wanted to include it in terms of just raising this question of where we are in terms of, and again, there's no answer to this. Presidential historians are struggle and will continue to struggle with this question of how do we use social media as sources? Uh, this is not an easy one to answer. The top left uh, picture, the screenshot I should, I should emphasize, is a screenshot of Russian propaganda, uh, you know, knocked up by Russian troll farms during the 2016 election. This is the ultimate fake news, to use that phrase, that was used in attempt to undercut um, American unity to drive more partisan division. And arguably, it was very successful in doing that. It used the culture wars very effectively. And of course, you also have the fact that while Donald Trump has been uh, booted off, off Twitter, well, we could still access all of his historic tweets. That's not a problem. Access is not the issue. The problem is analyzing them as sources in terms of how do we analyze what exactly he was thinking, who typed this, uh, and you know what's going on here. And I use this screenshot at the bottom right as this infamous example of I think this was before Twitter increased its word count by 100 or, you know, its character count. So this is when he said, um, oh, well, nobody knew in 2017 when he wrote this what he was talking about in terms of the military. This is his ban on transgender people joining the military. And, you know, we, if you just leave it like that after consultation with military experts, you've got the whole country and the world thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen? You know, do I hide in the bunker? What's going to happen? Um, it, it's just this question of, complete lack of thinking things through um, and having a, a structure that ensures stability and consistent policy and all these sorts of things, uh, which is what I'm gonna talk a bit more about now. So I think what's really interesting if we think about trends in presidential power in the 21st century is this rise in executive orders. The rise in hyperpartisanship since 1994 and the Republican revolution, Newt Gingrich um, and the sort of Republican takeover of Congress at that point that hyperpartisanship has meant that there's been increased gridlock in Congress. Increased gridlock means that the president relies more and more on their own executive authority and powers. And this obviously has pros and cons to it. The biggest con to relying on an executive order um, or an executive memo is the fact that obviously it could be overturned when the next executive comes into, into office it, it is, of course, right that these executive orders be balanced and checked by if they're challenging court, for example. That's absolutely right. A famous example is 
as in the top picture there, Trump's infamous Muslim ban, uh, which, you know, it, it took him three different attempts to get that through the court. And obviously his first attempt was extremely um, problematic, prejudicial, discriminatory, um, and offensive to a lot of people. Um, and it, it, it was seen that way and caused, you know, chaos at the airports, for example. Uh, there, was, there was no plan. So executive orders normally, traditionally, are seen as something that is a last resort. I can't get this through Congress. I can't work with them. Therefore, I will have to issue this. But it doesn't mean that your legacy is going to remain intact. And of course, nothing reveals that more than the U.S. being removed during the Trump administration from both the Iran Nuclear Treaty and the Paris Climate Accord. Another interesting parallel, a lot of conservatives would argue, and they do argue, that Obama's DACA, the uh, Deferred Action of, ch of Childhood Arrivals, um, protecting uh, illegal immigrants if they arrived as children, you know, making sure that they weren't placed uh, under blame, that they were not uh, treated harshly because obviously it was not their decision to come to the U.S. They were brought to the U.S. So his appointment, uh, his his decision to go ahead with DACA as an executive order was after attempt at attempt to try and get immigration reform through Congress. Many presidents have tried, few have succeeded. DACA was obviously went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court decided in favor of Obama, and yet, you know, conservatives will rail against this continually, saying, "Look." You keep going on, you liberal media keep going on about executive orders and presidential power, but your guy did this. What are you talking about? You're the big government people. That's the sort of conservative line. Um, is, is that, well, you, you could rail all you want about what we're doing, but, but, but your guy started it. Um, and so it's a very interesting dynamic considering that obviously we, we'll be talking in a minute about whether Trump is a representative Republican, uh, whether he's even conservative. Uh, in terms of his sort of ideological stance, if it can be identified. But, you know, in terms of immigration, he, he took a very sort of discriminatory, um, you know, even beyond conservative line on immigration. Um, but he certainly wasn't shy about using his power in office. That only grew as he became more knowledgeable and arguably more dangerous as he became more knowledgeable of the inner workings of the executive office over time. Another flip-flop is the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and pipelines as well. So Barack Obama, for example, vetoed the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, he was very much in favor of environmental protection, whereas Trump obviously uh, had Scott Pruitt as the head of the EPA. Scott Pruitt had sued the EPA and certainly was not a fan of the EPA. Not exactly uh, an ideal person to head the Agency for Environmental Protection. And it just shows this sort of flip flop in terms of the executive orders that he issued, um, allowing you know oil and coal and all of these sorts of things. As you can see in that picture at the bottom there, Trump digs coal. Another one, uh, and an interesting one really, is banning bump stocks. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar. Uh, I'll just very quickly summarize that bump stocks. People became familiar with them after the massacre in Las Vegas, the shooting of over 50 people at a country and Western concert. Uh, from a hotel, um, and it, uh, it revealed that a bump stock was used. A bump stock was something that you would add to a semi-automatic weapon, um, and it would indiscriminately shoot and uh, obviously kill people. Um, many people, were, unless you were a gun enthusiast, were not familiar with bump stocks. I was not familiar with bump stocks, but gun control is obviously something that is central to the culture wars. It's something that presidents have tried again and again um, to do something about, considering that the majority of Americans are in favor of universal background checks. However, over defeating the NRA, uh, the National Rifle Association, which is one of the strongest lobbies on the Hill, uh, is very, very challenging. And, you know, the, the NRA will rate um, legislators from A to F in terms of whether they support um, gun, uh, gun, whether they support gun control or not. Obviously, they are against gun control. So banning bump stocks is quite notable for a Republican president to do. Uh, Republican presidents are not, not likely to act on gun control. So the fact that he took an executive order to do that is interesting and sort of notable in of itself. Now, how representative is Trump of the Republican Party? This is something that uh, is, is, <laughs> is a big kahuna of a debate. So obviously we all know that in the bottom left there, he signed a loyalty pledge 
to the Republican Party, Mitch McConnell was very keen for him to do this. And one of the questions that I would love to ask Mitch McConnell, and which I would sure I would never get a straight answer, was that, you know, do you regret that? <laughs> Considering that the Republican Party is kind of in the woods, do you regret that? Um, because obviously they didn't think that he was really going to win um, and he was certainly a dark horse candidate in that respect. However, he did go with, along with the Republican Party in terms of the TCJA, that's the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, Republicans always in favor of tax cuts, uh, but obviously these were and have been found out uh, and a lot of voters have become unsympathetic to the fact that they mostly were helpful to the wealthy Americans not anyone else, despite the rhetoric saying otherwise. So this was something that he, he sat with his party on this. He supported his party. There was consensus. They got it done. He was also consistent in terms of appointing judges that were consistently pro-life. Um, Amy Coney Barrett, his third and final appointment to the Supreme Court is a key example of this. Um, and it, it has raised increasing concerns amongst Americans and others over whether Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned, whether abortion will remain legal and possible in the United States. So this is something that has had real long-term consequences and something that the way that the Republican Party um, dealt with this issue, knowing that their base will reliably come out and vote um, based on judges, be they federal judges, be they Supreme Court judges, this is an issue that will get the vote out. And Trump delivered. So this is something, especially with the fact that the judges tend to be on the younger side, is going to be his legacy for a very, very long time. Military withdrawal. This is an interesting one. Military withdrawal. I'm thinking in particular the case where Trump turned his back on the Kurds who have been helping the Americans in the Middle East for a very long time with an unplanned, uh, unannounced military withdrawal that even angered people like Lindsey Graham, a uh, Republican from South Carolina, for example. So this is something that was not really consistent with the Republican Party. And I've had a peek at some of the questions that were submitted in advance. I know you guys have some questions about foreign policy, so I won't go into too much of that now, but it's certainly a really interesting place to be. Relations with autocrats. Again, his foreign policy, I don't think we could call it a doctrine, um, but his Trump's foreign policy was very much distinctive of his own um, and reflective of his own quirks, uh, to put it that way. This is not something that is very reflective of a Republican Party dogma. He banned bump stocks, as I said before. This, again, is not something consistent with the Republican Party. Obviously, I've included pictures here as well of Liz Cheney, who's been booted out as a, a, a House Republican leader, leadership conference, and then at the bottom, these are the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Republican senators who voted to impeach Trump during his second impeachment. Okay. Well, I know I couldn't talk about Trump without talking about January 6th. So, I mean, again, I haven't included any words on this side because that picture doesn't really need words. I'm just gonna say that I think so many people were shocked and saddened about January 6th that it opened up a lot of questions as to the tenor of the country um, and this is not something that is going to be resolved in the short term. It's also something that if we think about, for example, last week, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was passed. Uh, that was over 100 years, over a century of campaigning. The reason why <laughs> it took, there are many reasons why it took so long, but they debated passing this bill before January 6th, so they didn't get it through. It only passed after white male politicians had themselves been put at risk. And I think that's a really important point to sort of take to heart when we think about, for example, systemic racism, when we think about these culture wars. Uh, this was really shocking with the sort of cheers of hang Mike Pence. Uh, and, and you see that depicted there. So finally, uh, the impeachment trials. I found it personally really interesting that people are, well, uh, people seem to be less sympathetic to the first impeachment attempt relating, of course, to Trump seeming to want foreign intervention in the 2020 election, for its support, that is, versus the post-January uh, 6. Um, maybe it's because foreign policy doesn't really feature as much in American politics or the voters' minds. I don't know. But it's an interesting dynamic. So we see these different impeachment trials that have started historically. Um, 
<laughs> and it, it, it's an interesting dynamic. We can see that obviously there have been three Nixon, Clinton, Trump that are relatively recent history, you know, last 50 years. And this is a concerning trend. It's something that I think reflects the sort of increase in hyperpartisanship. And I think we need to take a really hard look as to how we can effectively check a president in the 21st century. How could we work together, Congress and the executive, without making sure that presidential power doesn't become overwhelming? So uh, with that, um, I have started a Twitter account at Oval Offerings uh, where I discuss presidential history. I'd, I'd really love for you to join and engage with me there. Uh, if you'd like to read it, any of my publications, I'm also on Women Also Know History. Uh, so please feel free to take a look. And with that, I will uh, be very glad to answer your questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Laura. That was fascinating. Um, I am going to, um, should we start with some of the, the advanced ones, um, just to sort of get people's brain juices flowing, and then hopefully some people from the audience um, will ask a question. There should be the Q&A function or the chat function for people to submit questions, um, or you can email them to me at development.events at St. St lst andsorgauk and I can read them out to Laura. Um, okay, let's begin. So the first one is, do you think the disenfranchised white working class that Trump's policies resonated with so strongly can influence American politics during the Biden administration? And if so, how? I think this is a really, really interesting question. Obviously, people were asking it before 2020 in terms of can Biden win back those states that were supposed to be the Democratic blue wall that flipped against Hillary and enabled Trump to win in the first place. Um, and I think Biden being from, obviously, he emphasizes his origins being from Scranton in Pennsylvania. And so he has this connection. He tries to emphasize his connection with these voters. Um, I think people do vote their pocketbooks. So in terms of the economy, if things continue to go downhill and people don't feel good about where they are economically, um, I think that it's going to be harder and harder for the Democrats to make that connection. Um, it's always a hard sell considering that the Democrats are sometimes stereotyped as being elitist. And of course, focusing on scientific evidence, even though it's absolutely right to do when you're in the middle of a pandemic, focusing on experts, is it, it, it doesn't help that image. So it's definitely a question of PR and sort of targeting the right image, but uh, it's certainly something the Biden administration has attempted to do. Great, thank you. Um, the second one is, how do you think Trump would have responded to Russia's invasion of Ukraine? A very topical question. It is a very topical question. Uh, wow. Um, I think, I mean, we could see how he has responded even out of office. and even though it hasn't been rightfully, arguably, hasn't been aired on a lot of the sort of main news channels. Um, he has been talking to his uh, conservative channels and has been sort of sympathetic to Russian propaganda uh, more than anything else, which is exceedingly concerning. I think something that is not asked enough and maybe something that should be asked more is this question of would Putin have even made the decision to invade if not for four years of the Trump administration, who, of course, weakened America on the world stage. He liked to think of himself as, you know, oh, I'm so strong. I, you know, talk with autocrats. They're one, you know, I'm one of them. I'm a tough guy. And, and yet, you know, it's just, it just weakened America completely and, and broke away from allies. So I think there is definitely some, um, uh, I mean, not finger pointy, but he is certainly culpable. He is certainly, uh, he can't be, he can't be left out of this conversation when we talk about the decisions that Putin has made and how the world has changed. Um, so I, th I think it's, it's very concerning um, to think about where we are and how we got there. Um, thank you, Laura. Um, another question is, how can Biden reassure his country that his actions on Ukraine show strong resolve rather than weakness? <laughs> yeah, who looks strong at the moment? That's the problem. Um, it's almost impossible, and I don't use that word lightly, 
but I feel like it's almost impossible for any of the Western alliances to look strong right now. And I say Western alliances because, you know, they have to work together with this issue. Obviously, we've seen, for example, today, I saw on the news that the Czech Republic has made the decision to send tanks directly to Ukraine. Um, and even though they are old Soviet era tanks, they're still sending them. Um, and, you know, that's a very gutsy move uh, to stand by Ukraine in, in that st sort of strategic strength uh, way. And it's something that is concerning in the sense that obviously you could see the fact that Western alliances versus Russia, this is like a proxy war. And yet it can very easily obviously escalate from there. So there are very limited options for Biden, whose foreign policy was already looking weak, considering the pullout from Afghanistan and that chaotic um, pullout. Um, there are limited options again for him on this. And he's trying to refocus on domestic, which I can understand in a midterm year, but we're not even that way out of the pandemic. You, you just can't do that. You, you have to see these things as, as interconnected and deal with them as such. So I think it's going to be very hard for Biden to sort of overcome that image. Mm. Um, so partially linked to that, Gavin Jones asks, um, one of the characteristics of recent presidents in their age is their age, which mm -hmm. has impacted their ability to do the job. Is this trend going to continue? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think two things about this. One, I would say that, you know, W. Bush and Obama uh, sort of show that, you know, you can have younger middle-aged guys uh, who, who do the job. It's not necessarily, obviously, you know, SNL was poking fun at the fact that we're going to end up with an old white guy again. And we did end up with an old white guy again. Um, it could have been a reflection of America wanting to return to some sense of normality after Trump. But then again, obviously, Trump, you know, was chosen in the first place, and, and he certainly was not young when he was inaugurated. So it's difficult, I think, just after two presidents to say it's a trend per se. Whether it's going to continue, it's very, very difficult to, to, sort of, to sort of, I think that the way that the parties are structured right now in terms of leadership, I think that it's very hard, for example, for an AOC to overwhelm Nancy Pelosi. So I think that people who are um, on the sort of younger generation may have to wait their turn a bit. They may run, but they may have to wait their turn a bit. Whereas you may continue to see, um, probably not Bernie Sanders, but who knows, um, you may continue to see uh, people of that generation uh, try and lead their party. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to even suggest who, who, who that could be on the Republican side in 2024, but that's the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and leading on from that, do the political stereotypes of pork and dub still apply in America's political landscape? Pork and dub, well, that takes you back to teaching in Mississippi. And I was shocked considering how much the, those terms are bandied about. You ask, you know, first year students to define them and, and they got it completely the opposite way, which, which sort of shocked me. Um, but then there was also misspelling of Britain, which I made clear to correct. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I think that we are no longer necessarily in an era in which we could identify neoconservatives in the way that we could during the W. Bush administration, war hawks per se. It is not, we're seeing more an era of, not isolationism, but certainly turning inwards. Even though you have someone, for example, like Biden who embraces multilateralism, he still has this pressure to focus domestically. So because of that, it means that you don't necessarily, especially considering the fact that all of the guys who had worked from the Nixon administration, you could see this sort of conservative group think on the Hawk side, from the Nixon administration through to the W. Bush administration. I'm talking like Dick Cheney, um, Colin Powell came in in the Reagan, in the H. W. Bush administration, excuse me, Donald Rumsfeld, all of these guys, Donald Russell was a Ford administration as well. So all of these guys came about in a similar era and, and they really reflected that in their thinking. We don't have that anymore in the same way because the world just looks very different. Nobody, especially considering the technology that has advanced, people are more focused on drones instead of boots on the ground, uh, to use that phrase. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's not necessarily as clear cut as it once was, for sure. Um, Ronald Stevenson asks, um, from a presidential history point of view, which past president is most closely analogous to Trump? Is most closely, sorry? Uh, 
uh, I might be mispronouncing this word, analogous, A-N-A-L-O-G-O-U-S. Oh, okay, 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 analogous, yeah. Um, analogous. which, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I lost you in a glitch though, that, that's fine. Um, God, what a question. Um, <laughs> uh, it's kind of, it's kind of tipping me toward my, my comfort zone for lack of, an, of another expression, but let me put it this way. When, after January 6th, I wrote a piece about Andrew Jackson and how he was the only president to be censured by Congress. And censure is literally like a slap on the wrist, like a pink slip. It's, it's something that said, oh, you know, don't do that again. It has no qualifiers, consequences, anything like that. So it's very different from impeachment. And I was concerned, <laughs> I remain concerned, uh, as many people do, about the fact that obviously Trump, very large family, still receives uh, from American taxpayers the benefits of all of that security for his very large family, um, pension, and the ability to run again. Um, so the fact, <laughs> even though a lot of the things that he did were unprecedented, it doesn't mean that other presidents, they came out of nowhere, right? It doesn't mean that other presidents did not use presidential power in expansive ways. So for example, Andrew Jackson re-envisioned the veto in a way that was, he thought I'm elected by the nation. Therefore I could determine what's constitutional or not. Um, and that, you know, that's what he did, including ignoring the Supreme Court when they said you can't kick out the Cherokees from Georgia. Um, and th this is something that obviously has huge, I mean, it was genocide, it was genocide. Um, and it's something that had huge consequences and ramifications. So when we look at these things, uh, it matters. It's a really important question. It matters to sort of look at these things, even though they're a different context, different place in time, to see how presidents can use presidential power um, and in order to effectively check it in the future. Thank you, Laura. Um, and moving on from that, um, but in the sort of, lots of people seem interested in, um, you know, who may or may not be president, um, do you think we will ever see a female or LGBT president of the United States? Well, um, actually, a lot of historians say that we've already had a gay president um, in terms of James Buchanan, actually. Um, he was a bachelor. Uh, he was known for having a close relationship with a, uh, obviously, they were all male uh, congressmen um, at the time. And, uh, you know, they, they lived together um, as sort of boardroom uh, flatmates, if you like. So it was kind of an open secret. There hasn't been a lot of research, obviously, as you can imagine, it's very difficult uh, to do research on that sort of topic. There's not a lot of sources that are left, obviously, because it was very taboo. Um, but historians do say that, that you know, if it, that, that is not necessarily unprecedented. What would be unprecedented is obviously an openly a gay person or a person of the LGBTQIA plus community to be president. And of course, you could look at somebody um, probably within the Democratic Party who are more sort of open and accepting and inclusive in this way. Um, and we look at sort of um, Buttigieg, for example, as a key example. Um, I mean, his painting is in Pembroke, actually, if you're ever in the Pembroke Hall, uh, there's a painting of Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg, and he's Biden's uh, Secretary of Transportation. Um, and obviously he's openly gay married. Um, and the fact that he ran for the presidency gained so much traction. I often always thought of him almost in, in sort of JFK ways. He's young, he had military experience, he was a Rhodes Scholar. He had all of these sort of similar connections that made him more, maybe more acceptable to the mainstream. Um, but, you know, it definitely shows that it's possible in terms of female president. I really, really hope so. <laughs> I really, really hope so. Um, it's something that it's to, I, to, I, I, not to turn it into a lecture, but just to summarize this, having lived in the South, I know that had just how much Southern culture, having felt like Southern whites in the mid 20th century, having felt like they lost the civil rights movement, lost the civil rights movement, they took on a war on women, basically. And this was very much entrenched in evangelical religion, this idea of where women's place should be. This took on opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment. This is what it 
and it was very effective, perhaps more effective than the opposition to the civil rights movement. And it has continued. And we can see that today with, um, for example, yesterday, the bill that was passed in Oklahoma, um, attempting to ban abortion period. Um, we could see that it's very much alive. Um, so I hope, um, you know, that we can have more female representation, especially uh, a female president. Um, but I also think that, you know, we, we should stop looking at things as, you know, like abortion is simply a women's issue, you know, um, because I think it, it, it does cause uh, people to sort of take on um, less inclusive perspectives. So I think that there's a big culture war issue to overcome, but I like to think one day uh, we'll definitely have a, have a female president. Um, reminds me of that TV program um, that was on on BBC. I think it's still on BBC. I played Mrs. America, um, which covered. I think Kate Blanchett was in it, and it covered a range of um, interesting issues that you've sort of just touched on. Um, which lead that leads perfectly onto another question, which is: um, Do you think religion will always play a part in American politics, and how important is it that presidents declare themselves Christian? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. And, you know, there's a long history of religion in, in American political history, especially, for example, um, you know, if we think of sort of anti-Catholicism when we had uh, immigrants from Ireland escaping the Great Famine um, in, in the 1840s, for example, a rise of German immigration at the same time after the revolutions of 1848. And you had this sort of uh, rise of these feelings. Um, so it's always been there. And we can see, obviously, with JFK, um, you know, concerns about, oh, he's going to be managed by the Pope, and these sort of irrational paranoia concerns over the fact that he was a Catholic. Obviously, Biden's a Catholic, and, and that hasn't been raised. Um, people talk a little bit of, about, oh, well, when does he go to church? Who does he talk to, sort of thing, but not in, I wouldn't say it's that much different than when conservatives are looking at Trump and saying, does he read the Bible? You know, Romans 2, and, you know, just <laughs> that sort of thing, um, how he tried to overcome that. Um, so I think that in terms of Christianity, I think religion is always going to be there. In terms of Christianity, even though obviously it shouldn't be a qualifier, the founding fathers wanted separation churches to say, um, it is definitely still something that culturally is, is very important. Um, and it's something that is challenging sometimes if, if, if you live in a uh, democratic free speech society. Um, uh, you know, I just 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 thinking about my time in the Bible Belt, <laughs> it, it can be really difficult because it, it's not um, it's not it, 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 ha it has an impact on a whole variety of issues. Um, so, for example, some of the some of the most I actually I, I know I had a I would set a book review for my students to do, and uh, I once had a female student say I, I can't read this book, can't do it. And I'm just like, oh why? Oh, oh my priest says I can't. You know, I can't do it. Um, and it was simply because the book reflected looking at um, a cult in the 1840s. So it was looking at these movements and how it impacted people. And, you know, it was a history book, um, but, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't going to do it. And, and that was her choice. Um, but it does have these huge impacts on whether people are open to ideas and inclusivity. And um, so, yeah, I, th I think sort of Christian culture um, has is definitely going to be there uh, to stay. Um, we've got one final question, which was submitted in advance, um, which again I think is still somewhere in the in the background of the media. Which is, do you think they will bring charges against Donald Trump? Charges against Donald Trump. <laughs> I uh, I don't know whether anyone has uh, seen the movie Fahrenheit Eleven Nine. It's Michael Moore's film and it has this great imagined clip of Trump in handcuffs it's like, but it's one of those things that if if there ever were charges a lot of people look to the SDNY the Southern District of New York um, as the sort of um, uh, pr prolific uh, investigator um, that's, the, that's the sort of uh, team that you look at in order to push uh, the investigation to a point where someone can be prosecuted and there are so many different things with Trump. I don't think anything is going to come from Congress. Um, it, I, I, I just, I think it's very, very challenging um, to, I mean, we don't even know what's in his tax returns. <laughs> it to sort of overcome everything that he has managed to get by with. Um, it's, 
it's difficult to sort of see what it would be, where, where the evidence would be so overwhelming, um, because obviously he was able to instigate himself very well. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see, obviously, I think it's going to keep bubbling along and keep people employed for a very long time. Whether it actually ends in anything uh, is definitely an open question. Mm. And we've just had another um, question submitted, which is, uh, who is, in your opinion, the one American president who gave the most impact socially and economically before Trump? Socially and economically. Socially and economically. Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm leaning either toward, uh, you know, I'm sort of playing ping pong in my head between FDR and LBJ. Uh, just because obviously they're two really iconic presidents. LBJ modeled himself after FDR, FDR, New Deal. Obviously, he wanted to go farther. He wanted to, for example, do health care reform, but he couldn't do it because of the white Southern conservative Democrats. So LBJ was able to do things that FDR wasn't. But if it hadn't been for FDR, then maybe he would have had to have had a different starting point. So I think uh, it will probably be, um, you know, FDR in terms of socioeconomically because he was given the opportunity with the Great Depression and again with World War II to remake American society. Um, and, you know, he did that successfully because they were in a period of crisis. So um, probably FDR. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, how much more time do you have, Laura? Did you want to wait for any more questions or shall we shall we wrap up no i mean i mean if that's if, if, if that if that's everyone uh you know i'm happy, happy to to wrap that there i, I didn't want to stretch people's uh, attention span <laughs> <laughs> no and i'm sure if um if people do have questions then i'm sure um you'll be happy to answer them um if they email us would that be okay if they email absolutely the absolutely i can pass them on to you Brilliant. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Laura. It's been a really interesting evening. Thank you so much, Jason. My pleasure.